Hey everybody, hope you're doing well today. Today we are going to cover chapter 23 lecture. <clears throat> We're going to begin chapter 23 lecture. Chapter 23 is the respiratory system. I want you to understand um, the basics of respiration though real quick. Respiration is, when we're talking about respiration, the origins of respiration come from the word cellular respiration. So go ahead and take a note about that, cellular respiration. This is the process by which cells use glucose and oxygen to make ATP. Right, so the equation C6H12O6 plus O2 arrow gives us CO2 plus H2O. And I always like to put in parentheses plus ATP. Even though we're not balancing that equation at all, the whole goal is we're going to use glucose C6H12O6 plus oxygen O2. <clears throat> and we're going to make two waste products. We're going to make CO2 and water. And then we are going to also release that ATP, and that's kind of the main goal. Now, as long as cells are doing this, cell respiration, then they remain alive. But once a cell stop undergoing cell respiration, then those cells are going to die, right? And so this is why cells need oxygen, right? Why is it that if we don't breathe for three to five minutes that we start to experience death? And that's because our cells need to always make ATP. As long as they're undergoing cellular respiration, then we can do that, okay? Now, I've always taught this a more traditional way, and I'd like for you to jot this down, that the more traditional way to cover this is that there are three big groups of stages, three big groups of steps for respiration. The first step is called external respiration, and external respiration traditionally has been defined as the process of getting gases from the outside air into the lungs and then into the bloodstream and transporting around the bloodstream. Then we talk about another term called internal respiration. And again, these are more traditional terms, internal respiration. And this is where cells are exchanging with the bloodstream. So now we've got the oxygen in the blood. We're going to give it to the cells and we're going to take the cells waste their CO2, right? So internal respiration is kind of what happens after external, after we get it into the blood, then from the blood, we get it to the cells and back. The third component is cellular respiration. And cellular respiration is what we just mentioned, right? This is what makes ATP, keeps cells alive. This is the reason for life, right, is to make ATP. It's kind of silly, but that's really it. As long as we're making ATP, we're alive, right? So three big groups of steps. Now, I want you to realize that when we're talking about the three groups of steps, that the majority of this chapter and the majority of what we're going to discuss really has to do with that first group of steps called external respiration. And in external respiration, the three groups of steps, the first step is called pulmonary ventilation. And pulmonary ventilation is the process of getting air in and out of the lungs. To ventilate something is just to move air through it. And so to ventilate the pulmonary region is to ventilate the lungs, to get air moving in and out of the lungs. The next step is gas exchange, or also referred to, especially in this textbook, as alveolar gas exchange. So after we have pulmonary ventilation, the second step of external respiration is alveolar gas exchange, or just gas exchange. The third step for external respiration is gas transport and this is how we carry that these gases O2 and CO2 in our bloodstream okay now our textbook kind of does this differently instead of having external respiration internal respiration and cellular respiration they like to call the whole process external respiration and cellular respiration our textbook very rarely just this first slide we're about to hit mentions cellular respiration the the goal here is they change everything to external respiration and they kind of include internal respiration as an extra step of external respiration so i want you to be aware of how the textbook covers this so again Traditionally, we talk about external respiration, then internal respiration and cellular. Our textbook just wants to go external only. So they like to go, the first stage is pulmonary ventilation. The second stage is 
alveolar gas exchange where we're exchanging between the lungs and the bloodstream. And the third stage is gas transport. And our fourth stage is referred to now as systemic gas exchange instead of internal respiration. So the fourth stage, systemic gas exchange, is where we exchange between the cells and the bloodstream, right? The exact same thing as internal. So it doesn't matter which textbook you look at and how you kind of buy into it. The goal is that we've got to get these gases from the outside air into the cells so that their mitochondria can use that oxygen with the, with the glucose to make ATP and then release that byproduct. And again, cell respiration is the whole key. They barely mention it right here. Cells engage in aerobic cellular respiration. Cell respiration is necessary for life. It's referred to as aerobic, right, because it uses oxygen. So we need oxygen. And this is how we name the entire system. The respiratory system is named after cell respiration. And a lot of people don't realize that. So we need to get the O2 in and the CO2 out, right? So O2 needs to come in and CO2 needs to go out. So the respiratory system is going to provide the means for this gas exchange and the ability to get that, those gases in and out of the body. Here's just kind of what we just finished talking about. Every cell needs to get oxygen. They're going to, in their mitochondria, make that ATP so that that cell can function properly, and then they're going to release carbon dioxide, that byproduct. Now, the respiratory system is going to work together with uh, several other systems, and this just kind of makes sense. The respiratory system is really dealing with the lungs and gas exchange, but in order to achieve this gas exchange, we're going to have to use the skeletal and the muscular system to raise the rib cage, to drop the diaphragm. Right. And so we're going to have to use this to change what's happening in the thoracic cavity to affect the pressures in there so that then we can start to get air movement. Air is going to flow exactly like blood did when we talked about it in the cardiovascular system. Air is going to flow from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. And eventually when we separate that air into its individual gases like oxygen and CO2, they are also going to move from high to low on their own pressure. So we're going to call those partial pressures eventually. The PO2, just the pressure of oxygen, we're going to move oxygen from high to low. And then PCO2, the pressure of carbon dioxide, we're going to move it from high to low. But in order to move these pressures, to create these pressures, we have to make a volume change. And so the skeleton, the skeleton and the muscles are important to create that volume change. The nervous system is super important to stimulate these muscles and to coordinate the breathing activity, right? And then we intimately are connected to the cardiovascular system because this is where the gas transport takes place. In order to achieve the true cellular respiration, we actually have to use this transport system to get the oxygen to those areas. Now, here's our general functions, short and sweet, not too tough. There's um, this is all of them, I do believe. So we've just got five. Um, the first function is that it provides an air passageway, a site, a conducting portion to and from the lungs. And that's something I want to mention real quick. We refer to the air passageways. When we're dividing your respiratory system, we divide it kind of at the larynx. And above the larynx, we call it upper respiratory. Below the larynx, we call it lower respiratory, right? And that's something you may have heard before. I've got an upper respiratory infection or a lower respiratory cold, right? But I think it's better to divide it functionally so that we see that there is a conducting portion and there is a respiratory portion. The air passageway that simply takes air to and from the lungs is referred to as the conducting portion. Right, so you should definitely take that down. That the conducting portion is the air passageway, and I want you to know that this conducting portion is lined by a very specific lining called respiratory mucosa. Respiratory mucosa, it makes mucus and it conditions, and that's part of what we're trying to do with this air passageway as well as sending air to and from. We're also trying to condition that air, make sure it's warm, make sure that it's humid, make sure it's clean, right? Before it hits the lungs, that's what the lungs want is warm, humid, clean air. So the air passageway, the conducting system, the respiratory mucosa help to provide that conditioning. It also provides a site for oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. We like to refer this at to as the re respiratory portion. We just talked about the conducting portion, the tubes that move the air to and from the lungs. Now, in the lungs, the lining of the alveoli connected to the capillaries of the bloodstream, that's where we have our site for gas exchange. We call that area the respiratory portion. 
where gas exchange actually takes place. And I want you to know it has a different lining. We say that this area has a lining called the respiratory membrane. The respiratory membrane is a lining that we can exchange through. And so this is where the diffusion of those gases is going to take place. Kind of like we line the conducting portion with respiratory mucosa, we line the respiratory portion with the respiratory membrane. Okay. Now another function that we're familiar with is in our nasal cavity. We use that for the sense of smell, for olfactory, odor detection. And our larynx we use for sound production. And so uh, you're hearing my voice now because my um, vocal cords are simply vibrating back and forth due to the air going across them, but they're vibrating like a guitar string, right? And so it's kind of a, a stringed wind instrument is what our vocal cords are. And again, sound production from the larynx is very important for us to communicate. The whole goal kind of of what we're doing here is to maintain the balance of the levels of what we're talking about this whole time, right? I've been telling y'all for cardiovascular, make sure that you know that O2, CO2, and pH are the main triggers that's going to make any changes in those two systems, CVS or respiratory, and that's really the main goal. We're trying to maintain the balance of the oxygen so cells have all that they need trying to make sure that we don't have too much waste, carbon dioxide, and hydrogens, right? The hydrogens are super important because they're very interactive. They're very, um, they're, they're free radicals, right? So they are very reactive and that can cause a problem. Now let's start talking a little bit about this process and let's look first at how do the lungs remain inflated inside of our body. The cavity linings, the visceral and parietal, parietal linings, these guys don't forget the visceral and parietal pleura. These guys are going to have a fluid in between them called serous fluid. We're going to call it pleural fluid. And so this pleural fluid keeps these two layers stuck to each other. Because these two layers are stuck to each other, due to the surface tension of that pleural fluid, that type of serous fluid, if we can expand the chest wall, then we can inflate the lungs. Okay, so that's something I want you to realize that there in between the visceral and parietal, we have fluid that creates a vacuum, so that creates a suction. So the lungs are sucked to the inside of our chest wall. If we change the anatomy of the chest wall, then we can also change the, the volume of the lungs. Now, the lungs themselves have a lot of elastic tissue. So if you don't suction it to the chest wall, they naturally want to recoil and your lung, the lungs naturally want to collapse. And obviously, that's not a good thing. So here, we just mentioned that there's the space and that in between the um, in between the visceral and parietal layers, we're going to call that the intrapleural space. But in there, we have fluid. And in that region, we have a pressure. That's called intrapleural pressure. <clears throat> All that I want you to realize is that the intrapleural pressure must be negative, or at least it must be lower than what's called the intrapulmonary pressure. Intrapulmonary pressure is the air pressure that's inside your lungs. Okay, So intrapulmonary is the pressure in the lungs. And intrapleural is the pressure between the visceral and parietal. Here we see the lungs, intrapulmonary, and here we see visceral and parietal layer, and we see the pleural cavity. Here's where we measure that intrapleural pressure. The key is, if we only have fluid there, it should create a suction, and a suction is negative pressure. Okay, so that has to remain lower than the intrapleural or else we're going to have a collapsed lung. If we ever introduce air into that intral space, then the intrapleural pressure is going to drop. And all of a sudden we don't have this suction or it's going to rise. We don't have this suction. And now as a result, the lungs are going to collapse. So if something punctures through the skin and through the chest wall and punctures this intrapleural space, we're going to have atelectasis or we're going to have a collapsed lung that takes place. So again, the key here is intrapleural pressure must be lower than intrapulmonary in order to remain inflated. And intrapulmonary pressure is the pressure inside of your lungs. Now, I want us to go ahead and take another term down real quick. And that term is um, atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is the... Um, Atmospheric pressure is the pressure of the outside air. 
Okay, so what I want you to know is that atmospheric pressure, the pressure of outside air, we're going to use a constant for that. It changes depending on your, your altitude and depending on the weather. But I want us to know just for this class that 760 millimeters of mercury is going to be our baseline. Okay, 760 mmHgs is going to be our baseline, and that is base, mmHg, excuse me, is basically um, not going to change uh, when we're kind of talking about this respiratory system. What I want you to realize is that the intrapulmonary pressure is going to change around the atmospheric. So we're not going to be able to change the atmospheric pressure, but we have to have a pressure gradient, just like in the bloodstream, from high to low in order to get air to flow. So we're going to keep the outside pressure constant. And if we can change the volume of our chest cavity, then that's going to affect the pressure. Remember, we learned previously, and we're going to learn it again, Boyle's Law. Pressure and volume are opposite. If one goes up, the other goes down. So we increase the volume of the lungs, then the intrapulmonary pressure, the pressure in the lungs, is going to decrease. And now that we've got lower pressure in the lungs, air is going to move from high to low. So then we're going to inhale. So again, the atmospheric pressure, 760 mmHgs, that's not going to change. But intrapulmonary pressure, when we change our diaphragm and rib cage and change the volume of our thoracic cavity, intrapulmonary pressure changes around atmospheric. When intrapulmonary drops, we inhale, and that's due to increased volume of our lungs, expanding the lungs. When we decrease the volume of our lungs, then that's going to push air out and that's going to cause exhalation and that decreased volume means that in our lungs we have higher intrapulmonary pressure so that's the key when the intrapulmonary pressure gets higher we exhale when it gets lower we're going to inhale and all of this is due to simply changing the shape of the thoracic cavity in the lungs. Now I mentioned just a second ago an injury that allows air into that pleural region. An injury that might um, puncture through the body, a penetrating wound, you know, through the chest, a bullet, a knife, something like that, you know, you're running, uh, you're on a motorcycle in the woods and you hit a tree, then it could be a limb or something, you know. So air can be introduced by ribs, punctured, puncturing the lungs, you know, something like that. But this injury allowing air into the pleural cavity is called pneumothorax. And what happens is pneumothorax is going to lead to what's referred to as atelectasis. And atelectasis is the proper term for a collapsed lung. Now, usually it's not the entire lung that collapses. Usually it's just a portion of the lung. And so pneumothorax is the injury and atelectasis is the results. Pneumothorax is an injury that allows air there. And atelectasis is the resulting collapsed lung. Now, here's what I mentioned in the very beginning. This textbook likes to say that all respiration is simply external. It doesn't really focus on cellular, and it should a little bit more. But respiration is basically, or how they're going to describe it, external respiration is getting air or getting gases from the outside air into the cells and making them use it, right? And so... Again, we talked about this. Pulmonary ventilation is the process of moving air in and out of the lungs. Then we move it into the blood, and that's called alveolar gas exchange between the lungs and the bloodstream. Once we're in the lungs, we're going to transport that gas and take it where it needs to be. And then we're going to drop those gases off and pick up the waste gas during systemic gas exchange. So this is exchange between the blood and all of the cells of our body, our systemic cells. Now, again, these are going to be the four steps, and this is really kind of the main focus of this chapter. We're going to cover both of these gas exchanges at the same time, so we're not really going to cover this last. We're going to cover this kind of in the middle and just kind of assume that you understand that that is kind of what's happening there towards the end. <clears throat> Again, here's the big picture. We're going to inhale air as a whole, <clears throat> and that air is going to get into our lungs, and then it's going to diffuse from the alveoli into the pulmonary capillaries. There's alveolar gas exchange. And so number one was pulmonary ventilation, right? And then um, the blood from the lungs is going to be transported throughout the body and transported to the systemic cells. At those cells, we're going to drop off the oxygen and pick up their CO2. That's called systemic gas exchange. So O2 in, CO2 out of the cells and into the bloodstream. Then we're going to take that CO2 back to the lung. Here's our 
gas transport one more time. And then at the lungs, we're going to experience the other end of alveolar gas exchange where we allow that CO2 to diffuse out and into the atmospheric air. And that is the process of expiration. So here's just kind of a little a little imagery to show you from the atmosphere into the lungs, from the lungs into the blood, from the blood to the cells. And then we're going to go back. CO2 is going to uh, O2 in and CO2 out. So I want you to go ahead and put this in your memory. Make sure that you understand. In order for O2 to flow from the air to the cells, give yourself a little note that O2 is highest outside in the atmosphere and it is lowest in the cells. Right, and if we know that it's oh, there's more oxygen in the air that we breathe versus where the cells are using it, then that means oxygen always moves from the air into the cells. And then let's write the opposite: the opposite that CO2 is highest in the cells, that's where it's made, and it's lowest in the outside air in the atmosphere. And so as a result, we're going to go high to low. CO2 is then going to go all the way out and into the atmosphere. Okay, basically what we're going to do for this whole chapter. Here's a quick little description. Table 23.2 is in your textbook. You can take a look at that. Now, I've kind of already hit the basics of pulmonary ventilation, um, but let's look at some details. Pulmonary ventilation, and this is really kind of about half of the chapter. Pulmonary ventilation, moving air in and out of the lungs, is what we commonly call breathing. So a lot of times if I ask... Um, you know, what is what is respiration? What is the respiratory process? People always say breathing, but breathing is just the first part. Breathing is only moving air in and out, right? Now, again, don't forget, this is due to pressure changes. And in order to get these pressure changes, we have to create volume changes. So we're going to change the volume of the lungs. That's going to affect the pressure, and that's going to cause that air to move. There are two types of breathing, right? Not just inhalation and exhalation. That's not what we're talking about, right? Sometimes called inspiration and expiration. So one group of that inhale and exhale is called a respiratory cycle, right? But there's two types of breathing. There's quiet breathing, which you're probably doing right now while you're listening to this. And then there's forced breathing. If you're you know, on a treadmill listening to this, if you're on the elliptical machine or a bike, you know, working out, well, then you're experiencing forced breathing. So forced breathing is what we do with ex with exercise, right? Vigorous breathing that tends to happen with exercise. Now, let's talk about these a little bit. Um, as I've already mentioned, air moves down the pressure gradient. So during inspiration or inhalation, we're going to have higher pressure outside of the body compared to inside the lungs. So intrapulmonary is going to be lower than um, atmospheric pressure. And the opposite is true for expiration or exhalation. And that means that the air pressure is going to be highest in the lungs and lowest in the atmosphere. So we're going to move the air out. Now, as I mentioned, we're going to do this by changing the shape of the ribs and the diaphragm. So I want you to know that during quiet breathing, and quiet breathing is also called eupnea. So I want you to definitely know that eupnea is the proper term for quiet breathing. Eu means true. Pnea means breathing. You've heard pnea before whenever you've heard the word apnea, right? So apnea means to stop breathing. For example, while you're asleep, eupnea is true breathing, just your normal quiet breathing. I want you to realize that there's two main muscles involved. The diaphragm does most of the work. Diaphragm is below, does about 75% of the work. When it relaxes, it domes up. So it lessens the volume in the lungs and increases pressure, causing exhalation. When it contracts, it flattens out and it pulls the lungs down from below. And therefore, it increases the volume and decreases the pressure and sets us up for inhalation. Right, So the diaphragm is doing about 75% of the work. And then the external intercostals, these are the main muscles that are lifting the ribs to help get a little extra 25 to 30 percent volume change from above. So two main muscles during quiet breathing, diaphragm and external intercostals. Now these muscles are only active during inhalation. Okay, During exhalation, these muscles relax and I want you to know that just like we talked about in blood vessels and arteries, we have the term elastic rebound here again. Okay, I want you to know that when we relax these muscles, that the elastic fibers recoil and they force the air out of the lungs. So exhalation, 
during eupnea or quiet breathing is a passive process. It is saving us energy. We're constantly breathing, so if we can save half of the energy of breathing by making it elastic instead of muscles that are doing the job, then we can save half of our energy, right? So that's a good thing. Active, these two muscles are active to inhale, but then these muscles are passive. They don't do anything. There's no muscles that contract to cause exhalation. Now, hyperpnea is forced breathing, right? And all I want you to know during exercise, when you're breathing heavy, then we're going to use extra muscles. We like to call these accessory muscles. And you can give yourself a note, anything that attaches to the ribs or can help the diaphragm, right? And that's kind of what we're saying. So we're going to get things like sternocleidomastoid, our internal intercostals, subcostal muscles, um, even, uh, you know, some of our serratus muscles are involved. So any muscle that attaches to the ribs are going to be involved with hyperpnea or force breathing. Now, when you're exercising, it uses more energy. You have both active inhalation and exhalation. So in other words, when you are exercising and you're undergoing forced breathing, you are using extra muscles to do both inhale and exhale. Okay, compared to our quiet breathing where we didn't use muscles to exhale. We got that for free. Okay, now I'm going to move past this, right? I just want to show you this image, right? Inhalation, we're going to increase the size of the thoracic cavity by dropping diaphragm and lifting the rib cage. Increase V equals decrease P. When we decrease the pressure, that means we're going to move the air in, right? And you can kind of see what these ribs are doing here. Here, whenever we um, exhale, we let the diaphragm relax. It domes up and the rib cage drops and it changes the size of the lungs. It lessens the volume and it increases the pressure and therefore it creates exhalation to come out of our lungs. Now again, here's Boyle's Law. Don't forget Boyle's Law says that pressure and volume are opposite. As volume goes up, pressure goes down, and as volume goes down, pressure goes up. Now the whole key is we're going to use Boyle's Law with our muscles in our, our thoracic cavity to make a volume change of our lungs and then that creates the pressure change and the pressure change creates the gradient, the higher the low, that forces air to move, that forces either inhalation or exhalation. Okay, now here they're simply just showing you that if you've got more volume, you got the same particles, if we time it, they're going to move so far, right? They may bounce off of these two walls. Pressure is actually bouncing against a wall. So if we time it five seconds, we got one, two, three bounces. But over here, if we lessen the volume and we time this joker, we got one, two, three, four, five, six bounces in that same time. The amount of bouncing against the wall, the amount of pressure that these molecules exert on the canister is really what we're talking about here with our pressure. So when we decrease volume, we increase pressure. We create more um, force pushing outward on the um, structure, on the lungs, for example. Here's what we've already talked about. Atmospheric pressure, this is the pressure of the outside air, and this is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, MMHGs, right? And then we talked about intrapulmonary pressure. This is the pressure inside the lungs. This is what changes around atmospheric in order to create inhalation and exhalation, right? Now, intrapleural pressure, the only thing that we wanted to mention with this is that it must remain lower than intrapulmonary to keep lungs inflated, right? This must be negative in order to keep the lungs inflated. So nothing major there that we need to focus on. Now, as we've already talked about, we're going to change the volume of the thoracic cavity. That's going to create a pressure gradient, and then that gradient determines the airflow. When we increase the volume, that's going to decrease the pressure, and now that makes air moves into the lungs, and we get inspiration or inhalation. When we decrease the volume by relaxing the rib cage and the diaphragm, it domes up, then we're going to get exhalation because that pressure increases and air is going to move out of the lungs. Quiet breathing, eupnea, I definitely want you to know, as I've already mentioned, diaphragm does most of the work, two-thirds to three-quarters of the work, and the external intercostals do the other little bit. But what I want you to know also is the changes in intrapulmonary pressure. During quiet breathing, you can go ahead and kind of make a generalization that the changes in intrapulmonary pressure during quiet breathing, it's either a plus or minus one. 
right? When we're sitting there quiet breathing, it doesn't take much change. So all we have to do is drop the pressure by one by increasing the volume of the lungs, and that's going to create our pressure gradient. 760 outside is higher than 759 inside, so now we get inhalation. If we when we breathe in, we're going to breathe in approximately 500 milliliters or half of a liter of air. And this is referred to as the tidal volume. Okay, so half of a liter of air is referred to as tidal volume. How much air in and out per breath? That's kind of similar to our stroke volume, how much blood came out per beat. But now it's the, the measurements are air per breath. For expiration, we're going to do the same thing. But again, we're going to increase the pressure only by one. So it's going to go up to 761. Whenever we have higher pressure in the lungs compared to outside, we're going to move fluid, excuse me, we're going to move air out of the lungs. And again, we're going to move the same amount that we moved in overall. So that tidal volume again is approximately half of a liter or 500 milliliters. Here's just kind of some imagery showing you that. I think we've already hit it enough. We don't really have to cover it too much. Here's another table kind of talking about some of these changes. Now again, forced breathing. This is whenever we are um, exercising, we're going to use additional muscles. We're going to be moving the chest cavity volumes a lot more. So bigger chest, bigger changes in volume make bigger changes in pressure, and the bigger pressure change equals faster and more air that's going to move in and out of the lungs. Here's simply just showing you how the pons, the medulla oblongata mainly, are kind of controlling that, and that should be expected. Again, the medulla oblongata is really kind of controlling a lot of autonomic functions, and of course, breathing is an autonomic function. As I mentioned before, apnea means absence of breathing or lack of breathing. If you hold your breath, then you are voluntarily creating an apnea, but many times we refer to it with sleep apnea, right? So sleep apnea, someone who snores, someone who all of a sudden stops breathing while they're asleep, and this can cause some serious problems. This eventually causes some serious problems on the heart, okay? And so sleep apnea is not something to just let pass by. You should definitely do something about it if you can. Um, breathing rate. Okay, let's talk about respiratory rate or breathing rate. So I simply want you to know that quiet breathing, it's about 12 to 15 breaths per minute. In other words, in other words, for every heartbeat, for every five heartbeats, there's approximately one breath. So if we've got 15 breaths and we got 75 beats per minute, then that means about every five heartbeats, we're going to have one breath. Okay, so as we increase our heart rate during exercise, we're also going to increase our respiratory rate or our breaths per minute. Now, very similar to um, what we've talked about with um, cardiovascular, we need to be able to control this breathing rate, right? Kind of like we had to control the heart rate. And so again, we're going to use reflexes. As I mentioned, these are autonomic reflexes stored there in that medulla oblongata, sometimes called medullary reflexes, right? And so here, Let's don't forget that we've got several things that can trigger changes. These things that can trigger these changes, we like to call them receptors. And so the receptors detect the change in the stimulus, and then they relay that to the um, to the medulla oblongata, and then the medulla oblongata sends out an automatic motor response, right? And that's what a reflex is. So we're going to look through these just real quick. Chemo receptor chemoreceptors, proprioceptors, baro or stretch receptors, and then irritant receptors, right? Now, again, I've already mentioned it's in the medulla oblongata, so that's nothing new, okay? Chemoreceptors, again, all I want you to know is what they are trying to detect. And you guys already know what they're trying to detect, O2, CO2, and pH, right? So we see it, PCO2, PO2, and pH. The P in front of it means pressure, of CO2, pressure of oxygen. So now we're paying attention to the oxygen levels and the CO2 levels in the blood and also those pH levels. Okay, Baroreceptors have to do with pressure. Now really what we're concerned about here is when the lungs stretch too much, right? That's going to trigger a baroreceptor. We don't want to overinflate the lungs. That's, that can actually rupture some alveoli, and that's definitely a bad thing, so we don't want to do that. So their baroreceptors help protect against overinflation. 
Proprioceptors. Proprioceptors monitor our joints and our muscles and our tendons. They kind of tell us what our body's doing at any one moment in time. But what I want you to understand is that when there's more proprioceptor stimulation, then we're going to start to breathe faster. And this makes sense. Whenever we're moving our body, right, because that's what proprioceptors do is they detect joints and muscles. They're detecting movement. When we move our body, exercise, for example, we're going to start to breathe faster, right, increase our breathing rate and our breathing depth. And so proprioceptors, I always like to think about it with exercise. The more you move, the more you breathe, right? It's just kind of how it is. Irritant receptors, that's, that's what they're talking about here. So make sure that you put that title here, irritant receptors, and they relate to sneezing and coughing. If we irritate parts of the respiratory tract, especially that conducting system, then we're going to have an extremely powerful, large pressure burst kind of released. You know, and that's what we call a sneeze or a cough. It's just we build up pressure, and then there's an explosive blast of exhaled air that tries to get rid of whatever is irritating. Um, that tract. Now we do have some higher brain centers, again things above the brain stem, things like the hypothalamus that can change breathing rate just like it can change heart rate based on temp. It can also change breathing rate based on your temperature. Just like we had in the cardiovascular system how your emotions can affect your blood pressure, the limbic system can also have effect in the breathing area in the respiratory centers and so it can affect breathing rate as well and then there's other areas so this is a little bit more unique you know you have the ability to change your breathing rate pretty readily voluntarily but you can't do that to your heart right we didn't talk about voluntarily making your heart speed up or slow down but our frontal lobe has the ability to make voluntary changes so right now if I ask you to breathe super quickly you know <laughs> So there, I can voluntarily change my breathing pattern compared to the heart. We didn't have that option, right? We can't just voluntarily speed up or slow down. So the frontal lobe, which again is kind of in control of, of motor commands, right? The outgoing controlling muscles. Um, this is where we can control those muscles voluntarily. Okay. Now, as I've already mentioned, pressure is what's driving this movement of gases in and out of the lungs and resistance is going to oppose flow and it opposes pressure so it's exactly like we wrote for cardiovascular p must be greater than r to equal flow right so let's talk real quick about some of the resistances we talked about some of those resistances in the bloodstream viscosity vessel length and diameter and turbulence so let's talk about some of the things dealing with airflow that can kind of provide resistance the first thing is referred to as compliance so give yourself that note compliance and this is elasticity of the chest wall right if we can't stretch the chest wall quite as easily then we have more resistance so more compliance equals more resistance a decrease in the elasticity okay something else is change of bronchial diameter and the size of the passageway that the air is moving we call this bronchoconstriction and bronchodilation the bronchioles kind of like the arterioles these are the smallest of the bronchi of the air passageways and here we have smooth muscle just like in our arterioles and this smooth muscle can constrict and dilate. So we talk about vasodil uh, excuse me, bronchoconstriction and bronchodilation as our main effects here. If you are bronchoconstricted, then you're getting less air through that passageway. So more constriction equals less flow or more resistance. And that just makes sense. If you've ever known anybody who has a food allergy and then their respiratory passageway starts to clench up, well, here we're seeing these bronchioles limiting how much air is moving in and out. Another thing is the collapse of an alveoli. Okay, so this collapse of an alveoli, obviously if you don't have as many alveoli, you're not going to be able to exchange as much and you're going to have more resistance. So we're going to have to keep the alveoli open and we're going to talk about that here in just a second. So here is what we're talking about. Collapsed alveoli are going to increase resistance. I want you to know that if these type 2 cells, these alveolar type 2 cells, don't produce a very important secretion. This secretion is called surfactant. What surfactant does is it keeps 
alveoli inflated. Inside the alveoli, there's a lot of moisture. I mentioned that we're going to condition the air and humidify it. So in there, there's a lot of moisture. And the inside this air sac, this moisture wants to stick to each other because we have um, water cohesion. And so this surfactant is an oily secretion. It coats that wall and kind of separates that water up so that then we don't have water cohesion quite as bad. And that allows the alveoli to remain inflated, right? Collapsed. If we collapse that alveoli by not producing enough of this surfactant, then we're going to have a collapsed lung portion and now we are not getting enough air. We have too much resistance. This can happen in infants and in kids, um, you know, but we, we call this condition a ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, when the alveoli collapse just spontaneously due to problems with those type 2 cells and the surfactant. Here's that compliance thing, talking quickly about um, the process of elasticity. As we get older, our compliance goes down, and so it takes more to move those lungs. Um, and then we talk about things like asthma that can change the size of the bronchioles. Bronchodilation is what asthma does, and so as a result, we kind of see that reduce in flow. We see the struggling to catch the breath and things like that. Increased resistance is going to mean that we have to inhale more forcefully. So we're going to have to work muscles a little bit harder. And eventually we're going to start to use more energy. So the person is going to become more and more exhausted just from breathing. And so now we're going to probably have to assist with some sort of oxygen or something like that so that the person can breathe a little bit shallower and still get as much oxygen as their cells need. Okay. Now to start start wrapping up this pulmonary ventilation, let's talk about some of the values that we need to understand. And these values have to do with volumes, kind of, of um, what's happening in the lungs, kind of like we talked about the volume of the ventricle as it contracted and relaxed and all that. Pulmonary ventilation does not have two definitions. This is really not a good way to look at this. Pulmonary ventilation is air moving in and out of the lungs, right? We like to call the air moving in and out of the lungs per minute instead of calling it pulmonary ventilation. That's a bad term. We want to call it respiratory minute volume. This is what you'll see many times recorded is, is respiratory minute volume, RMV. Okay, respiratory minute volume, how much air is moved in and out of the lungs in one minute? Well, this is similar to our cardiac output, and that was blood per minute, right? So respiratory minute volume, volume in one minute that respiratory moves, right? This is equal to something very similar to cardiac output. Cardiac output was the rate times the individual volume, right? Stroke volume times heart rate. We're going to do the same thing. Respiratory minute volume, or RMV, right, is equal to TV, tidal volume, and that's air per breath, times our respiratory rate, and our respiratory rate is breaths per minute. Again, we mark out the breaths, and then we get air over minutes, and so T TV times RR equals RMV. Again, they're calling it pulmonary ventilation. I don't like that term. We want to keep that just for air in and out of lungs. So let's call this respiratory minute volume instead. Now, this is the amount of air that's actually entering the body, but not necessarily the amount of air that's entering the lungs. Just like whenever you have a soda or some kind of drink that you get at a fast food restaurant, you got a straw in it. You take a sip through that straw, liquid comes up to the straw to your lips, and that's what gets in your mouth. Your mouth is your lungs, right? That straw is the conducting portion. So some of the liquid remains in the conducting portion and never gets into your lips. Instead, it goes back down into the drink, right? What we call that straw in our lungs is the anatomic dead space. This is the space in the conducting zone and air is trapped in the tubes and it never reaches the lungs. So if we try to calculate alveolar ventilation or how much air reaches the lungs per minute, air to the alveoli per minute, then we need to take away the anatomic dead space from our tidal volume, right? Tidal volume is how much air is coming in and out of the body. But we need to take away how much is trapped in the conducting portion or the straw, right, to understand how much actually reaches the lungs. So that's all we're going to do. Tidal volume minus anatomic dead space 
calculate that first, then multiply it by respiratory rate, and then now that can tell us how much air actually reaches the lungs per minute. You can see a difference here. For example, we got six liters for respiratory minute volume, but when we take away the ADS, we take away that anatomic dead space, then we're going to get 4.2 liters that actually reach the lungs. So 1.8 liters of that, of that gas never actually reached the lungs and was available for exchange. Okay. Now, we can measure this. We can measure these values, these volumes, with something called a spirometer. So a spirometer is something that you breathe into, and it measures these lung capacities. It measures your tidal volume, and it can measure some other things. So we can use this for diagnostic and assessment of our respiratory health, right? And so we can use this, for example, if someone is demonstrating asthma. We can use this before and then try to induce their asthma and do it after, and we can compare the volumes and see what changes and how can we better assist a patient you know, based on these values. Here's the values that you need to be aware of. Tidal volume, we already know that, and there is a chart in our textbook. Figure 23.24, I think it's still that image. I'm not, I don't have a page number right beside me. But here is an image. It shows us our tidal volume going up and down. Inhalation, exhalation, inhalation, exhalation, inhalation, exhalation, right? So that's our, our normal tidal volume. We're just sitting there chilling, breathing. About 500 milliliters or half of a liter. But while you're sitting there chilling, breathing, all of a sudden, take an extra long, deep breath in and inhale as much as you possibly can. So you're sitting there breathing and all of a sudden... You can inhale for an extra long time and you can get extra air in. That extra volume of air that we can get in above normal tidal volume is called inspiratory reserve volume. Air above tidal volume that can be inhaled. So we can inhale more than we normally do. When we exercise, we start to hit our inspiratory, respir inspiratory reserve volume. We tap into it to try to get more airflow to and from the lungs, right? Just like we can in inhale extra, we can also exhale extra. So randomly, whenever you're sitting there breathing, just... So we can blow out extra air for, for an extra time after our normal tidal volume. This is referred to as expiratory reserve volume. And then that leaves what's left in the lungs. And just like in the heart, just because we pump blood doesn't mean we pumped it all. We're going to leave some in the lung, some in the heart. And that's going to be called the air left in the lungs after max exhale is called residual volume. So the lungs are not collapsed. They're not deflated 100%. There's still air in those lungs. Just like whenever we um, pump blood out of our heart with stroke volume, we still have our ESV, that leftover volume that's in the ventricle. Now, we can calculate these other two, and I want you to be able to calculate these. Vital capacity is simply how much air can you move in one breath. So if you think about it logically, we take our normal tidal volume, which is eupnea, and then we add what we got with hyperpnea, with forced breathing, our inspiratory plus our expiratory reserve. So we add those three together, and we get the vital capacity, and vital means living or life. So we get the capacity that we can move in one breath. If we take that vital capacity and then add that last number, so basically if we add all of our numbers together, we add tidal, uh, we add vital capacity plus residual volume, then we're going to get TLC, total lung capacity, not tender loving care. That's a little different, but we're going to get our total lung capacity, right? And this is in total how much air can the lungs contain. Now, when we look here, a really good graph, we see inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. That's our normal tidal volume, but all of a sudden, extra air in. Here's our inspiratory reserve, extra air in above tidal volume, and then extra air out. So here it's showing us our expiratory reserve. If we go from the bottom of our expiratory to the top of our inspiratory, that includes the inspiratory, the TV, and the ERV, now we've got our vital capacity, right? If we include that leftover air that stays in the lungs, now we have residual volume. And if we add the residual to the vital capacity, now we have total lung capacity, okay?
here's a, a little chart that's in the text and you can find this chart and it kind of goes over all of this stuff and it helps you to understand a little bit better we didn't do functional residual volume we just did residual volume okay we didn't do inspiratory capacity we just added vital capacity and total lung capacity as our other two all right so at that point we have finished pulmonary ventilation we finished about a little over half of the chapter I'm gonna cut this recording off and then I'm gonna record the rest of the chapter in a second part and that way you have these guys split up now I don't think this chapter is that difficult but if you have trouble with this pressure and volume and movement of air and, and gases then you definitely need to revisit that and think about it because that's really what we've been focused on with this pulmonary ventilation and that's really all that we did today was pulmonary ventilation next class we will move forward and we will take a look at our gas exchange at both the alveoli and at the systemic area and so we'll cover that and then we'll look at gas transport and we'll wrap it up all right. I hope that you have a wonderful afternoon, and if you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch with me. Thanks a lot.